Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features X-Men Volume 2, number 10, cover dated July 1992. And this begins the last couple of issues of Jim Lee on the number one best-selling title that he launched the year previous. And what we're getting at this point is a Jim Lee whose attention is very divided between finishing off his run on the X-Men and also starting Wildcats over at Image, the comic, uh, the comic company that he co-founded with Todd McFarlane, Rob Liefeld and others. But this cover is pretty good. I like this one. It's eye-catching. It's got an interesting design. It involves uh, the uh, Mojoverse and uh, obviously the Cover caption here says, because you demanded it, but I wonder how many people did demand it, the return of long shots. So this has been teased since issues uh, five, six, and seven of the series. And now we're getting into the meat of this particular storyline of long shot leading an uprising against Mojo. And it's also the subject of 1992's X annuals. Uh, and the X-Men annual itself, uh, the adjectiveless X-Men annual, overseen by Jim Lee, um, laid out the art for that particular uh, uh, annual and also provided the plot. So he was the um, kind of main creative on that storyline involving Mojo and the Mojoverse in those raft of annuals. But what I really like about this particular cover, and it's penciled and inked by Jim Lee, and I always do like when an artist uh, inks their own work as well, is this bank of TV screens uh, behind the main figures here in the foreground, and also the fact that Longshot is being knocked up against the X-Men logo, and so it's kind of cracking there against his head, and his hand there is cracking uh, the top corner of the N as well. So uh, yeah, uh, eye-catching cover. Let's open it up to the first page. And this particular issue, uh, the main story, there's a main story, there's an A story. This one, ha where Happy Little Bluebirds Fly, um, a parody homage to The Wizard of Oz. And um, it's only 16 pages long, so it's not the usual 2021 20, pages, shorter than usual, and instead, of uh, the normal length of a story we have a seven page backup story featuring maverick the character introduced in issues five six and seven um, in a previous storyline before the ghost rider crossover between x-men and ghost rider so the creative team here a jim lee joint with supporting cast featuring scott lobdell now all lobdell is providing is the words on the page the dialogue the narrative captions scott williams on inks but also uh, Bob Wycheck, um, um, Alstadter, I'm trying to remember his name, is it um, Carl? Carl Alstadter, Dan Panosian, Lois Bahalis and Tom Orzakowski, they're a married couple. And this is interesting here, we don't have Joe Rosas on the colors, instead we've got just a first name here, Ariana, and I looked her up, Ariana Lenshock, and she was a um, Marvel um, office staffer, and so she's obviously been called in to color this particular issue in a pinch. Um, I'm pretty certain that this one was up against a uh, deadline crunch as well. And uh, that's our creative team. Now there's some coloring errors in this um, issue as well. And that definitely has to do with the fact that the colorist is uh, not so familiar with some of the characters and maybe was working in a rush as well. So the story opens. I like the layout of the panels uh, for this opening page. These This cascade of um, fragmentary panels ending in this crash as Longshot has been bounced around in what will turn out to be the X-Mansion. Um, flying in the midst of a tornado or whirlwind like the opening of The Wizard of Oz. And uh, let's see what happens on the next page. Well, here we go. We have the X-Mansion crashed to the ground and Longshot delivering the famous line, uh, why do I think I'm not in Kansas anymore? But also, more importantly, why did I feel the need to say that? I don't even know what Kansas is. So it's obvious I won't be getting any answers from you, mystery friend. Sorry about the house I wasn't steering. So whoever this is, is the equivalent of the Wicked Witch of the uh, of the west or the east, I forget, I think it's the east um, in The Wizard of Oz. 
If I knew where I came from, I'd have a better idea which way to get out of here. So this is a, um, a reconfiguration of Longshot's arrival in the X universe where he just popped up in the middle of the danger room. So that's all reversed now. And, uh, but he's as amnesiac as he was in his first appearances in the Marvel Universe in his own miniseries. And as I said, when he popped up in the middle of uh, the danger room. Um, so um, here we see these very uh, altered versions of our heroes, the X-Men, Rogue, Wolverine, and Cyclops, and their characters are kind of turned upside down, um, or there's some kind of play on their particular powers, as in the case of Rogue. So Cyclops here, very indecisive. We see that he's got little bits of straw um, coming out of uh, uh, the, uh, the binding parts and belt parts of his costume. He says here, who am I to judge? Um, and so he is very indecisive and here we have um, a long shot wondering about the familiarity of the looks of the people Wolverine here with a very um, upside down character you probably beat me up in grade school he says everybody else did it hurt lots I'd rather not talk about it and then Rogue here um, basically saying that she'd like to shake his hand, but she can't. She can't touch anyone ever. Kissing is out of the question. So she's got all of these. She's got the manacles on her hand and uh, the gag on her mouth as well. And then Cyclops again, very indecisive. I tell you what's wrong with me, but it's not my place to say. I mean, who am I? A nobody, right? I'm not about to tell someone else what to do. I doubt it would be good advice. I doubt everything. So all of this is topsy-turvy. Everything's upside down, everything's different from expected. And then along comes the beast. We've got the yellow brick road here with the um, toadstools um, as well. So we, we have a recall of the imagery from the, the film. And beast here, what's up with him? Well, he can't speak. And uh, Longshot says to him, look, little fellow, unless you can tell me who's behind all of this. And beast here does his best, Rojo, he says. Rose Rojo, I mean, who's Rojo? asks Longshot. By the way, in terms of who is inking these opening pages, um, I've seen page one in the IDW uh, uh, Jim Lee X-Men Artist Edition, and there's no other signature on this page except for Jim Lee's own, so it could simply be inked by him. I think he's inking some of these pages just as he did in the previous two issues. There's pages where I'm pretty sure it is Scott Williams that's inking, and there is one page where I'm very where I'm pretty sure that it's Dan Panosian on the inks. Um, but this is the other page that is in the um, IDW Jim Lee X-Men Artist Edition. And again, the only signature on this page is Jim Lee's own. And I think it is inked by Jim Lee rather than Scott Williams. And one of the clues to it is the way that the hair is rendered here on Wolverine's shoulder, and you can just see it here as well. That's not the way that Williams um, inks in um, arm hair, particularly Wolverine's. So my guess is that um, these pages are inked by Jim Lee himself. Um, and here, Longshot puts it together back to the story. He puts it together about what's up with the beast. He has a little um, kind of uh, memory unlock where he gets it. You're the beast. I'm Longshot and we're all trapped here on Mojo's world. That's it, isn't it? He's exaggerated your bestial nature, but allowed you to maintain your intelligence. Am I right? Beast here says, I rest, Row. This is really frustrating and a little tear coming from his eyes. But what I really like in these two panels is this upshot that we get of the beast and then this tight close up on him as well with the frustration really showing on his face. Um, these are two good uh, panels by Jim Lee. So um, here we get Longshot explaining what is the essence of uh, Mojo. They're being manipulated by him. He's using us to provide entertainment to an enslaved people. We're a narcotic for the masses. Um, so this is interesting because when Mojo was written by the likes of Chris Claremont and Anno Senti, um, he was a vehicle, the Mojoverse, the whole setup in the Mojoverse and Mojo world was a vehicle for satirizing um, big corporations and their exploitation of intellectual property and creatives. 
and you just don't get that here in um, this two-parter from Jim Lee. It's almost coming through that thematic, but not quite. And it would have been a wonderful time for him. I mean, like, it's so interesting that this is the last story he does for X-Men just as he's um, leaving Marvel in order to co-found Image and own his own creations. Um, so it's very suggestive as to uh, why he is um, ending on this storyline, but I think it's just happenstance. And as I said, I really think that it was a missed opportunity to really push on that satirical um, subtext that was there um, when Claremont and Nocenti uh, uh, wrote uh, Mojo and um, his whole Mojoverse uh, story world. So long shot here, frustrated regarding Mojo. I swear that when I get my hands around that massive neck of yours. But Cowardly Wolverine says, temper, t temper tantrums like that fella, you're liable to give yourself ulcers. And uh, Rogue says, maybe the wizard can find this Mojo. Because, 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 because he is a wizard after all. So who could the wizard be? And here in the distance is the wizard's castle. So they're en route on the yellow brick, road, yellow brick road. And then we see that this has all been um, filmed and the uh, film is stopped by Mojo. And he's getting the, uh, the audience figures here from his um, major domo, his uh, personal assistant. The latest figures are in Lord Mojo, your live broadcast of The Wizard of X has attained the highest ratings ever in the history of the Mojoverse. And then much more quietly, because he's always sarcastic, says, of course, it is broadcast on every channel on the planet. So Mojo's delighted. Like I've always said, Major Domo, everybody loves the classics. And who's he got prisoner here except for Professor X? And there's one of those coloring errors where the professor's teeth are colored in flesh color. So um, something to do with probably the rush job. Um, for the coloring on this particular issue. And um, these pages, I'm wondering whether they might not be inked by Scott Williams. I have a feeling that they are. In particular, this page looks very much like uh, Williams style. Um, yeah, the face on Major Domo here, the detail there, I, I would go for these being Williams inked pages. So Mojo um, continues here um, in terms of his scheme. Not every group of mutants, he says, manages to engender an entire planet of couch potatoes possessed by the attention span of a gerbil. Simply put, the X-Men mean ratings, and on my world, ratings mean power. I'll show that pirate network why Mojo is the undisputed commander-in-chief programmer. So this is a link to the X-Men annuals of 1992, and in particular Jim Lee's one, the Adjectiveless X-Men annual, because there is another contender for Mojo's position. Mojo 2 is uh, what ultimately he'll be revealed to uh, have as a name. So there's Longshot leading Rebellion, there's Mojo 2, and these are the challengers that Mojo is facing as tyrant of the Mojoverse. But nice art on these pages. I like this um, tight close-up on Mojo's grinning visage. And um, very much, I would say, Jim Lee thinking and looking at Art Adams' um, original uh, um, drawings of Mojo for this particular storyline. Um, this is another page that could be inked by Scott Williams, but it might also be inked by Bob Wycheck. Wycheck is the main inker on the next um, chapter of uh, the two-part storyline. So it's one or the other inking this particular page here. Uh, but you can see that Mojo has um, various of the X-Men captured, including Lila Cheney back there as well. So Gambit here says to Mojo, perhaps we can broaden your demographic base with an all-star production of The Fall of Mojo. Mojo here, I like it, but I'm afraid I'd have to cast X Factor. You see, Gambit, your audition tape didn't go very well. And Major Domo says, an all-too-kind review, my lard and master. Good pun there from um, Scott Lobdell in the dialogue. 
You can see that as super battles go, this would have made a good sitcom. Why don't we replay today's clever attack on the X-Men? So now we're going back in time in respect of the story to see how all of this got started. And um, here we've got uh, Dazzler managed to escape with your ability to ferry people through time, uh, through dimensions. We saw this back in um, issue number seven. There was a couple of pages about this escape of Dazzlers. And this little guy whose name is given, I think he's called Meek. Um, his name is given in a couple of pages time. We can contact your former allies, he says, and liberate Longshot. So let's see what happens. Well, they make their way to the X-Men and we're getting this recording again. Um, Cyclops here saying to Dazzler, rest a moment before you collapse. And Dazzler saying, no time, Scott. By the way, I like the design of this panel with Dazzler in the foreground, but in shadow, except for little details of her costume, including that star and good body language on her um, in the chair as well. And also some nice um, acting going on in the visuals where we've got Gambit there keeping an eye on Meek here in the foreground. Back to Dazzler's dialogue, she says, no time, Scott, in the language of the land, Longshot's rebellion has been put on permanent hiatus and the man himself is only moments away from cancellation. So, um, Mojo mutes the dialogue and he narrates um, um, over what occurred. Enough of this drivel, he says, let me narrate. Only I can give this scenario the verbal panache it deserves. In my immenseness, I must give you credit. Your own penchant for double dealing and subterfuge served you well, Gambit. You recognized Meek's treachery for what it was. Too late to prevent him from teleporting the lot of you to my own dimension, with not so much as a pitch meeting or a story treatment. There we go, and we can see them arcing away to the Mojoverse. And here they are arriving now. This page most definitely inked by Scott Williams. And you can see there with the fine detail on the hairs on the back of Wolverine's arm there, very distinctive of Scott Williams and his um, way of rendering those arm hairs. So a Scott Williams ink page here. And here we have um, Major Domo saying, and while you people excel at improvisations, the trauma of the transport left you ill-prepared for a cold reading. Emphasis on ill. Or maybe that's Mojo still talking there, but here he is in the recording. And he's saying, okay, people, X-Men fight for their lives, part eight, take one. And this is, uh, this is quite good here as well, a link into the uh, X continuity of the time where Wolverine says, as he's recovering from the transportation, the dimensional transportation, prefer spir spirals transport, less traumatic. Mojoverse again, might as well get a summer home here because he'd just been there over in his own title in Wolverine issue number 52. Um, and that was a three part storyline, 51, 52 and 53. So, um, here we are again. This is this, the way that the story is told here, non-linear throughout. Um, so we're flashing back here uh, with Mojo and his attack on them um, when they arrived in the Mojoverse. And his orders are to jam the minds of all cast members with telepathic abilities. So obviously that takes out Psylocke and also Professor X. And Professor X says here, don't concern me with your, do not concern yourself with me students, instead work together to get out of here. So Mojo, he's a powerful figure himself. He um, attacks and takes out both Gambit and Jubilee and that's why they're captured. Um, Cyclops here uh, saying, uh, our only chance is to act as a team or as Jubilee might say, turn the page here. It's time to pump up the jam. Again, I think this is a Scott Williams inked page. So he puts, pumps up the volume here and the soundtrack uh, distracts the attackers, but it's precisely what Alison Blair, AKA Dazzler needs in order to uh, charge up her mutant power, whereby she turns sound into light. 
And then she says, here we got this close up on her. Let's take this from the top mojo once more with feeling. And she blasts him. So again, in terms of who's inking these pages, my guess is these couple of pages could be inked by Bob Wycheck again, but I'm not 100% certain. But she lets rip here and Mojo's uh, angered and he wants the scene cut. And I mean that, cut her in two and have her thrown off the lot. Lousy temperamental scene stealing nobody bit player. But she continues attacking with her light powers saying no need for hostility people I was just leaving. Or did you think I'd wait around until my powers depleted? By the way, the lettering on this page by Lois Bahalis, not by um, Tom Orzakowski. Or did you think I'd wait around until my powers depleted? So some banter here from Major Domo, we were hoping. And um, Dazzler leaping over this soldier of Mojo's. We'll have to do lunch sometime, but until then, chew on this. So she strikes him right in the center of his forehead, pretty much. And Mojo's enraged. He says, Alison Blair, you've just been put on permanent hiatus. Good DeLuca effect here from Jim Lee. He's got Dazzler bouncing around acrobatically, evading the attacks of both Mojo, Major Domo, and Wolverine telling her to get going, find help. And as she exits the Citadel, she encounters um, Longshot, who was captured um, previously and who is under the influence of Mojo. And so Dazzler tells him, Longshot, snap out of it. Don't you see Mojo has you under his control? Longshot's reply is, of course he does. But I have my own dressing room, fruit basket and all. So we've got all of this language of, um, of, of, of acting and um, film running throughout the dialogue because of the nature of the Mojo verse. And then um, Mojo recovers from the earlier attack and he instructs his soldiers to obliterate Dazzler. But don't touch Longshot, my star performer. So this is another page inked by Scott Williams for sure. So she is caught by that blast um, and she's knocked down into this well or sore and Mojo says her death scene was mercifully short she did do her own stunts though I'll give her that and while I don't know if technically it was art I liked it and there we have the end of that particular recording with his triumph over the X-Men holding Longshot aloft and Wolverine 2 that ladies and gentle viewers was most definitely a wrap and so it would appear to be the end but um, here we are back in the present with the arrival of Longshot who has recovered his wits and, um, and also the X-Men who are still in the uh, hypnotic control of Mojo. Um, this particular page here, who's inked this one? This one, if I had to guess, I would say Carl Alstadter. And this page, I'm very certain is drawn or sorry inked rather by Dan Panosian. These marks on Professor X's, these hatch lines on Professor X's face, also Mojo's there, not Mojo, long shot there, and Mojo over here, that little hook um, hatch line, very distinctive of Pan Panosian style in this particular period of time. So my guess is Carl Alstadter here and Panosian on this particular page. So um, Mojo welling up over how good a uh, director he is and um, mocking Professor X there saying, you should know better than to judge a work in progress. Now with everyone in place, we return to our regularly scheduled program. And this is the X-Men arriving at the Citadel and little quotations there of the Wizard of Oz, but they're now to be faced off against by the other X-Men under Longshot's control. So we've got Gambit there, we've got Jubilee, Psylocke, and Lila Cheney there in the background. Wolverine, cowardly Wolverine saying here, it looks like they wanna fight it, they wanna fight. So Longshot determined, if that's what it takes to get to Mojo, overthrowing his ruling network, free Professor X and avenge my beloved's death, then let's get this over with. 
So Professor X unable to help at the moment. And Longshot Triumphant, Relax Charlie, the X. Haven't you ever heard of Creative License? So he starts laughing there villainously. And his laughter just continues as the scene switches to uh, outside and it's raining and Dazzler is, is she dead or alive? Well, she's collected by this mysterious figure in silhouette. As I suspected, he says, she washed ashore with the rest of the city's debris. So he asks that she be lifted gently, treat her like the gold she is, he says. For the Dazzler is our best chance to pull the final plug on Mojo TV. And it will be revealed in the next issue that this is Mojo 2. So this is the Mojo's rival, the pirate network he mentioned earlier in the story. So that's it. 16 pages of a story in this particular chapter 1 of a two-part storyline. And over here we can see... The reason why we're not getting a full story. Wildcats is advertised for the first time here. Um, issue number one advertised. And that's where Jim Lee's attention has gone. Also Joe Rosas. Where is he this issue? Joe Rosas is the colorist of Wildcats number one. So obviously um, 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 in, enticed by Jim Lee to work on uh, Wildcats rather than X-Men. And so we've got that guest colorist. And here's the backup story. The backup story is very slight. Not much going on in this. It's also part one of a two-part uh, storyline. There's seven pages here. Um, penciled and inked by Mark Teixeira. The creative team, Scott Lobdell. Writing Mike Rockwitz colors and Lois Bahalis on letters. But what I find interesting about this is that there's no credit for Jim Lee. So Maverick is Jim Lee's creation but he's not at all involved in this storyline according to the credits anyway which is interesting also Teixeira at this point Teixeira has just started his run on the Wolverine solo title it's a short but very memorable run where he does excellent work um, so he's working at the X office by this point and obviously Bob Harris has asked him to help out and uh, fill out this issue with this backup story. So here we've got Maverick surrounded and um, he gets rid or he basically, uh, how, would I, how would I put it? He deals with this particular situation by dropping uh, a magnesium flare. There it goes on the ground and he seals his armor and everybody else is killed in the explosion. So that's our kind of um, introduction to this story. And he is making his way into a laboratory where there is this particular doctor, Dr. Reiking, this figure in silhouette here, not revealed until the last page. It'll turn out his name is Warhammer and Mavericks arrived. So obviously he is interested in getting some information. And Warhammer here uh, says, is it Warhammer, is that his name? Yeah, I think it's Warhammer. He says here, Barrington needs you to answer a few questions to Dr. Reiking. And Barrington was the name that Maverick gave to Wolverine at the end of issue seven, that long kind of four part story about Wolverine and his past with um, Omega Red. Barrington was the name that Maverick gave to Wolverine at the end of the story. So mentioned here again, so who is this mysterious figure? This is a good top-down shot on Maverick by Teixeira. He takes off his mask, this is the first time we've seen his face, not that it really matters. We also get his name there, his surname North, um, he pulls his gun on the doctor and just as he's about to um, uh, pull the trigger, he's hit from behind and it's by this guy. As I said, I think his name is Warhammer. He says, until Dr. Reiking completes his experiments on my highly volatile frame, a body Barrington rendered nearly useless after my failed encounter with the X-Men, 
and there's an editorial note here that there's the story hasn't been told the scientist is under my protection you want to kill him you kill me first so now we're set up for a fight maverick puts on his face mask again and he says you're so eager to mambo with maverick fine i lead okay so that's the setup for the second part of the story so not much going on really in this uh, seven part uh, seven page um backup story really the star of all of this is teshera's art which is um in my opinion really really good stuff and that's it there's no letters page here at all so this is it the penultimate issue by jim lee on adjectiveless x-men let me know your thoughts on this particular storyline did you enjoy it at the time uh, what were your thoughts on it then and now? If you enjoyed my review and commentary, please like the video on YouTube. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.